Well, one of my favorite writers, authors over the years has, is a Presbyterian ordained minister named Frederick Buechner. Any Buechner fans here? Anybody read his books? Maybe I can convince a couple of you. Well, Buechner is now 92 years old and has written over 30 books, fiction, nonfiction, all kinds of stuff. And what I enjoy most about his writing is his wonderful way with words and a way of um, opening up the beauty of the gospel in just surprising and refreshing ways. For example, just a couple of quotes. On vocation, he writes, The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. On the truth of the gospel, If the truth is worth telling, it's worth making a fool of yourself to tell. I like that one as a preacher. About doubt. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith that keep it alive and moving. And about the promise of resurrection. What's lost is nothing to what's found, and all the death that ever was set next to life would scarcely fill a cup. Now, I, looking back, I think I discovered his writing at a time in my life, and I really needed to, to hear faith and the gospel expressed and described in, in, in new ways. And over the years, I've collected, I think, pretty much all his books. I actually have more Beekner books than I have C.S. Lewis books, but don't tell Jeff. <laughs> actually, he knows that. He's given me a couple of his gifts along the years. Uh, and for most of his life, Beekner has lived in the mountains of Vermont. And for several years in their lives, my mom and dad lived also in Vermont in late 80s, early 90s. So one of the times our family went to visit my parents in Vermont. My dad planned a surprise for me. He knew I was a Beekner fan. He had actually started to read some of the books. He knew he lived in Vermont. So he just opened a phone book one day and found his phone number. Remember phone books? And he just <laughs> dialed the number and he was shocked that Beekner himself answered the phone. So my dad sort of stammered through what he was thinking, trying to arrange a meeting so I could meet my, you know, my, this author I respected. And Beekner said uh, something like this, well, my wife's away for a few days. I'm here at the house by myself. Why don't you just come over for lunch? So he invited us to his house for lunch. So we drove an hour and a half or so through the mountains to a, this quaint little farmhouse. Uh, it wasn't exactly this house, but this reminds me of his home. Uh, just nestled in the beautiful mountains of Vermont. It was in the fall, and inside almost every wall was covered with books, exactly where you think a writer would live. So he met us at the door, and he invited us in, and he walked us into his kitchen. And we there, almost unbelievably, we sat at Frederick Bigner's kitchen table and watched him make tuna fish sandwiches for us for lunch. That's what he made. Uh, and we sat and we just talked. We asked him about his writing. He asked us about our lives as pastors. It was an act of just extraordinary grace and generosity on his part, which was just really fun. And it's been like 27 years since that lunch. And every time I have tuna, I, and my wife likes to make tuna melts for lunch, I still think of that time when we sat at a table and had lunch with Frederick Buechner. Now, we're in a summer series right now called With Jesus, and today we're going to look at a story that's really about sitting at a table, about eating with Jesus. It comes to us in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read the first 10 verses, stopping along the way to point out some points of interest. So follow along in the screens as I read. Luke writes, he, and that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. I'm going to stop after the first sentence. Um, Jesus here is on his way from Galilee in the north of Israel down to Jerusalem in the south. You can see this map here. The red line indicates his route. Now he's on his way to Jerusalem toward the end of his ministry. He knows the cross is waiting for him. But on the way, he takes this slight detour out to the east and so he can come through Jericho. He didn't have to go that way, but he did. He went through Jericho I think, on purpose. Because Luke tells us in the previous chapter, at the end of chapter 18, that there was a blind man just outside the gates of Jericho. When Jesus got there, he actually restored that man's sight, which created a huge buzz in the town of Jericho. So great crowds were welcoming him as he came in. And that leads us up to the story we're going to look at today. Jericho was also known as the City of Palms. It's a very low city. It's located like 800 feet below sea level. So it's very warm and tropical. Palm trees still grow there. This is a picture of modern day Jericho. It was also known for the production of a substance called balsam, which was used in a perfume that happened to be one of the most expensive perfumes in the world at that time. So it was an affluent trade city. Therefore, all also the center of taxation, which sets the stage for the story I'm going to read. Verse 2. And behold, there was a man there 
named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, I would guess that almost all of you know the basic outline of that story. You've heard it ever since Sunday school. If you were in church as a child, you might even have a little song going through your head. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Okay, well, just, I'm not, we're going to sing it. I just want it to go through your head all day long. <laughs> but the story really is not a children's story. If we understand the story uh, correctly, uh, deeply, it's actually kind of a disturbing story, even shocking if we understand it. So the first thing we see in this well-known story is that Zacchaeus was a curious man, a curious man. I've told lots of stories through the years about my younger brother, Joe, who's a pastor of a thriving church uh, between Akron and Cleveland and Ohio, Christ Community Chapel, four campuses, just a wonderful church. But my favorite stories of our growing up years have to do with his his unique personality uh, combination of being curious and somewhat fearless. And he's always been that way, curious and fearless. And in young boys, that can be a little dangerous. Well, when he was about five or six, uh, just had recently learned to ride a two-wheeler bike without the training wheels, uh, he went out for a ride one day, came back just a couple minutes later, face all scraped up, crying, and this is what happened. He had gone on his bike, was coasting down a hill, you know, just thrilled with the wind blowing, and, and he was fascinated by the front tire, watching it just rotate. And he said, the idea came into his five, six-year-old mind, what would happen if I stuck my foot in the spokes? (laughs) And it flipped him over, he skidded to a stop at his face, thus the crying and the injuries. Well, a little while after that, when he was in about fifth grade, um, he had a friend over after school one day, my parents were gone somewhere, I was at home, I was like in eighth grade, and he and his friend were playing somewhere in the house. All of a sudden, I hear this yelling and screaming, and they both of them come bursting out of the little small bathroom on our first floor, and I could smell this terrible smell, which later I found out was the smell of burning hair, and my brother had no eyebrows. <laughs> and this is what happened. They had heard a rumor at school that you could turn an aerosol can into a blowtorch. Some of you probably tried this. And so they snuck into the bathroom. He took some matches in there. He lit a match, and he gave the air freshener to his friend and said, now, and (laughs) burned his eyebrows right off, and he made me promise never to tell mom. Frederick Bigner once said, to be wise is to be eternally curious. Eh, I'm not sure that's always true. Well, this story tells us Zacchaeus was a curious man. Luke says, he, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now listen to all the ways he's described. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass pass that way. Just four verses tells us four things about Zacchaeus. First, he was a tax collector. Now, no one likes the tax collector. Sorry if you work for the IRS, just true. In Jesus' day, it was especially true because tax collectors were Jewish men who were essentially working for the hated Roman government that was in charge. They were seen as dishonest, greedy, and traitors to their own people. And we're told here that Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector, which meant he had other tax collectors working for him, which easily made him one of the most hated people in all of Jericho. On the spiritual side, Zacchaeus would have been regarded as unclean. Now, that's a, a term that was used in the Jewish world to describe people who were um, sinners, sinners. 
Uh, he worked with Gentiles. He would have been contaminated by Gentiles. Uh, he was not welcome into the temple of God. He would not have been welcome to offer sacrifices. He was seen as one whose sin was beyond atonement. He was a social and spiritual outcast. The second thing we see about Zacchaeus is that he was a rich man. He was identified as wealthy. Somewhere along the line, Zacchaeus had decided that he wanted to be rich more than he wanted to be liked. Because in those days, he would have had to bid for the, the job of tax collector. He would have had to promise the Roman government, I can raise this much for my territory. So he had to want to do that, and anything he got extra, he could keep for himself. So he made himself rich. He decided he wanted to be rich more than he wanted to honor God or be faithful to his own people. And just like our culture, being wealthy set him apart. The house where he lived, the clothes he wore, fine robes, rings on his fingers, that sort of thing. Thirdly, we see Zacchaeus was small in stature. You know, the Bible is a book about real people. It's not make-believe. It's a book about real people lived in real time, and it shares lots of real details about people's lives. You may not know this, but the Bible describes a whole lot of people and their physical characteristics. For example, the Bible talks about people who are tall. Who is tall in the Bible? Goliath doesn't count. Everybody knows that. King Saul in the Bible. We find out in 1 Samuel, King Saul was a head taller than everybody else in Israel. Tall guy. The Bible talks about bald people. In 2 Kings, we read that some youths tease the prophet Elisha about his baldness, taunting him with bald head, bald head, and Elisha called down a curse and bears come out of the forest and mauled 42 youth. It's, it's right there in the Bible. So our middle school kids, be careful. <laughs> Don't tell Andrew I said that. It talks about uh, evil King Eglon of the Moabites as being a fat man. In fact, he was so fat that when Ehud, the judge, stabbed him with a sword, the sword disappeared. It says it. You can read that beautiful story. It's in Judges chapter 3. It talks about Joseph and young King David as being so handsome that it actually got them in trouble with women. In Joseph's case, it wasn't really his fault. It talks about people who have long hair. Who had long hair in the Bible? The Samson doesn't count. Everybody knows that. Who else had long hair? One of David's sons named Absalom had hair that was so long, it said, it, it, the Bible says he cut it once a year and the remaining hair weighed two pounds. I don't know why that's in the Bible, but it's in the Bible. Also says his hair was so long it caught him in a tree branch once, and that's how he died, so be careful. <laughs> the long hair thing. Talks about people who are left-handed. King Ehud, the judge, the one who stabbed Eglon, was left-handed. Says that specifically. And there were 700 left-handed slingshot specialists in the Benjamite army who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Left-handed slingshot artist. But Zacchaeus is the only person in the entire Bible who's identified as being short. So he's got that going for him. Okay, but here's what I think about. Zacchaeus was identified first by his profession, tax collector, by his status, rich man, and by his physical appearance, he was short. What's interesting is we still do that today to people. That's still how we judge people, how we make our decisions based on externals. And I wonder about you. How do you most often think about yourself? What is your identity? Because that's what identity is, how you think about yourself. Do you think about yourself in external terms, what you do for a living, the house you live in, your wealth, your stature, what you look like, your athletic ability, your musical talent? All that stuff goes away eventually. Or do you anchor your identity in something deeper, something more permanent? We'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we learn one more thing about Zacchaeus, the most important thing in the story, and that is he's curious. He's spiritually curious about Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He's rich. He knows he's hated in his community. He knows that. He's very aware of that. And yet he's willing to wade through this crowd that would happily trample him to death if they could just to get a view of Jesus. He realizes he won't be able to see him because he's short, so he scrambles up into a tree. Now, this is a picture of what's called Zacchaeus sycamore fig in Jericho. Some think this is the actual tree. Probably not. It's 2,000 years ago. But it was a tree much like this. It's not an easy thing for a grown man, even though he's small, especially because he's small, to climb up in a tree with his fancy robes and the rings on his fingers, 
Why would he do such a thing in public? It's a humiliating thing, an embarrassing thing to do. Maybe he's heard that Jesus can do miracles, and he's, he's like wanting to see a show. Maybe he's just curious that way. Maybe he's become weary of being disliked and hated. Maybe he's discovered that all the money in the world can't make him happy. Maybe he's not exactly sure why he wants to see Jesus, but he does. You know, that's part of why we're going to do this Explore God thing in, the, in January, February, because we believe there are all kinds of people like Zacchaeus all around us, maybe some here today, who are curious, don't really know what they're looking for, don't even know where to start. And we want to be the kind of place where someone can start and ask questions. So Jesus then sees this rich man in fancy robes hanging in a tree, you can't miss him, and he makes a scandalous offer. That's the second point today, a scandalous offer. Offer. I recently saw a survey, and these surveys are all over the internet, but I saw this survey that claimed to list the most disliked men in America. Take a guess who was first on the list. Well, you don't have to say it out loud. But on this list, the first guy was Harvey Weinstein, the guy who's been accused by dozens of women of inappropriate behavior. Second on the list, and I had almost forgotten about this guy, Martin Shkreli, the hedge fund manager and CEO of a pharmaceutical company that, that raised the price of life-saving pills to $750 a tablet, that guy. Third on the list, President Trump. In fact, to be fair, most U.S. presidents eventually make their way to this list during their presidency. You can look up the list. They all, they all get there sooner or later. And then, of course, there's this guy. Never, never going to forgive that. Never, ever going to forgive that. Now, all these men have one thing in common, or several things in common. They're very wealthy, very powerful, and they did something that offended most of us in our country. Now, let's try to transplant this whole story to our modern day. Let's say Jesus is coming to town, and of course, everyone would want to see him, right? Even people who don't believe in him would want to go see him. What's he like? What's he look like? What can he do? Is it really him? So a giant crowd gathers, and then one of those guys is riding along in his limo, and he hears this is happening. So he tells his driver to stop the car. He gets out. He wants to see Jesus too. So he's going along in his $2,000 suit. There's a big crowd there. He can't see. So he scrambles up a light pole in the $2,000 suit, and he's hanging there, legs dangling out, the cab's showing, and it's embarrassing. But he just wants to see. So the whole crowd sees him up there, and first they start jeering and laughing because it looks funny. It looks ridiculous. And then they start jeering because they really don't like that guy. And they don't want him in their midst. And then Jesus, who's in the middle of the crowd, looks up and says, Hey, Harvey! He knows him. Hey, hey, Donald! Hey, Martin! Hey, Aaron! Well, maybe not Aaron. But he says, I'm coming to your house for dinner tonight. That would be surprising. But it doesn't even hold a candle to how surprising this is in the ancient world. Verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. In other words, have dinner. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, here we learn three things about Jesus. First, we learn that he knows Zacchaeus. He knows him by name. He doesn't say, hey, you up in the tree. Hey, rich guy. Hey, short guy. Hey, tax collector guy. He calls him by name. How does he know his name? Now, maybe he knows him by reputation. Maybe everybody knew who Zacchaeus was. Maybe he knows him because he's heard the, sh the crowd shouting his name in derision. Or maybe he knows him the same way he knows you and the same way he knows me. You know, the Bible says God knew you from before you were born. Before you even were, God knew you. You know, there are some people who know you by your externals and other people that know you by who you really are. That's what's happening here. Jesus knew Zacchaeus because he saw Zacchaeus. The crowd saw chief tax collector, rich man, a man who was to be hated and despised. Jesus saw a man with a profound spiritual need and a deep personal curiosity. A man willing to risk public hatred and ridicule, the humiliation of climbing a tree because he was short, just to look at Jesus. Jesus knows who you are from the inside out. People make judgments about the outside of us all the time. Jesus knows who we are 
on the inside. Last week, Jerry Root said, the God of the universe knows everything about you. He knows your successes, your joys. He knows your failures, your sins, your secrets. And yet, he loves you. You are fully known and fully loved. The, third th- the second thing we see here is that Jesus not only knows Zacchaeus, he wants to be with Zacchaeus. And this is the surprise of the story. Jesus invites himself over for dinner. Now, even in our culture, that's not something you do. That scene is it's just a little, little bit rude and odd to just invite yourself over for dinner. It's even more weird in that culture because in ancient Middle Eastern culture, to eat a meal with someone, to sit at their table, was considered one of the most intimate things you could do with someone. To eat meant, meant you were at peace with them, that you had a relationship that could be described as accepting and one of friendship. And here's the thing. In Jewish ceremonial religious law, there were very strict rules about who you could eat with and who you could not eat with. For example, a good Jew could not eat with a Gentile, a non-Jew, at their table because Gentiles were seen as unclean. They were separated from God, and their uncleanness would contaminate you. And then you'd have to go through all these ritual purification things. Okay, you get it? Here's the third thing we know about Jesus. He was willing to violate cultural and religious codes in order to be with a sinner like Zacchaeus. Notice his invitation uh, makes people uncomfortable. Luke says, and when they saw it, the crowd, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be with a sinner. Now the word grumble is an interesting word in the original language. It means to murmur greatly, to uh, complain intensely. It's like being in a, in a sports arena where 100% of the fans are from one team and, and they begin to jeer and boo a, a, a hated rival. That's what's going on here. How could he? How dare he? How could he offer friendship and love and acceptance to a man like that? But notice, Jesus does. And he does so publicly and intentionally because he wants the crowd to be witness of what happens next. And what happens next is a changed man. That's part three today, a changed man. Luke says, so he hurried and came down, received him joyfully, that's Zacchaeus receiving Jesus into his home, and when they saw it, they all grumbled, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood, this is probably at or after dinner, and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, remember he was in the business of defrauding, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now here we see three things about being with Jesus. The first one is grace comes first. Grace comes first. Notice Luke says Zacchaeus received him joyfully. Now, Zacchaeus knew who he was. He knew what he was. He also knew Jesus was a holy man, a rabbi. And so don't you think it should say, and so Zacchaeus was a little scared to have Jesus come over. Zacchaeus was a little hesitant to have Jesus come over. He's the sinner. Jesus is the holy one. It's like being taken to the principal's office, right? It says he received him joyfully. That's significant. The reaction of joy tells us a couple things. First, tells us something about the condition of Zacchaeus' heart in this moment. It tells us he knew he didn't deserve Jesus to come to his home. He knew he didn't deserve the invitation. He didn't expect Jesus to know him by name. It tells us something happened in that moment that can only be called grace. You know what grace is? Grace is the undeserved and unexpected favor of God the undeserved and unexpected favor of God. And grace comes first. Notice, Jesus didn't say, okay, Zacchaeus, uh, listen, you clean up your life a little bit, you stop ripping people off, you give back some of that money, then I'll come to your house. Not what he says. Grace comes first. I saw a tweet by a pastor named Andy Stanley, and many of you may follow him, uh, wonderful guy. This, this very week, And his tweet said this, religion says change and you can join us. Jesus says, follow me and you will change. Hear that? 
Religion says, change, clean up your act first, and you can come join us. Jesus says, follow me, come be with me, and you will change. The second thing we see about being with Jesus is that it produces transformation. It produces change. And Zacchaeus stood, said to the Lord, behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor. You see the story about Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon this week? He's starting a $2 billion charitable foundation. That's really generous, but it's not half. Half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Grace comes first, but grace produces change, transformation. Here's the point. Remember the whole unclean thing? Jesus was not contaminated by Zacchaeus' sin. Zacchaeus was contaminated by Jesus' grace. That's the way the gospel works. Zacchaeus the cheat became Zacchaeus the honest. Zacchaeus the rich becomes Zacchaeus the generous. Why? Because Zacchaeus was made new from the inside out, what Jesus called being born again. The third thing we see about being with Jesus is that it creates an identity shift. Now, this is easy to miss, identity shift. Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. And then this, since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, remember how Zacchaeus was identified in the early part of the story? Chief tax collector, rich, short, sinner. That's how people saw him. That's how he saw himself. But that's not how Jesus saw him. Jesus saw a broken, lonely, and desperate man. Jesus offered him grace. I'm coming to your house today. Jesus was with him, and salvation happened. Now Jesus says he is also a son of Abraham. That is the outcast, not even welcome at the temple, who everyone called a sinner, is now back in the family of God. No longer identified by his occupation, by his status, by his wealth, by his physical stature, even by his sin. Now identified by the grace and salvation of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of talk in our world today about identity. Identity. You've got to find, create your identity. The Bible says the only genuine true source of identity is the God who created us and the grace of Christ who gives us new heart, new purpose, and new destiny. You are not what other people say you are. You are not even what you feel about yourself. You are what Jesus says you are. You are who he says you are, and Jesus says you are his. You belong to him. You know, in every Jesus story, that we read in the Bible, or, or every story he told in the New Testament, uh, we have a chance to see ourselves. And if you're reading, and I encourage you to read the Bible on your own, if you're reading a Jesus story, don't stop reading it until you find yourself in the story, because you're there. We're all in the stories. But you have to read it a certain way to find yourself. And in this story, there's only two options. You can see yourself in Zacchaeus, that is, a man who chased wealth and status and power as his identity, a man who was identified as a sinner far from God and knew it, but who was also spiritually curious, spiritually hungry, spiritually desperate. Jesus offers him grace. He receives it joyfully and is changed. Salvation comes to his house. Or we can find ourselves in the crowd. People who thought of themselves as religious, but were really just self-righteous, grumbling about the grace Jesus offered that guy, pointing their finger at that guy. You know, we live in a culture of outrage, don't we? Everybody's outraged about something. But what I've noticed is people are only outraged about other people. They're never outraged about themselves and their own behavior, right? You can be in the crowd outraged about something and completely miss Jesus altogether. Here's what the story tells us, I think, bottom line. We are either with Jesus or we're just in the crowd. We're either with Jesus or we're just in the crowd. And grace, identity, and salvation are 
Transformation is not in the crowd. It's being with Jesus. Would you bow your heads as I close today in prayer? Lord, we thank you for your word. This story is so simple, a child can understand it, but it's not a children's story. It's our story. Help us to see that until we understand that we are Zacchaeus, separated from you by our sin, trapped in false identities that fail us, desperate for your grace, that we cannot be with you. Remind us that there are people like Zacchaeus all around us, those who are, feel far from you, those who even reject, feel rejected by others, who long just for an invitation to be with you, the one who loves them. So may we be part of that invitation. Pray these things in your name. Amen.